Come on, let's all stand together. Those of you who are with us on Facebook, we're glad you're here this morning with us. And uh, we're going to spend some time worshiping the Lord. Amen? Come on. says for us to bring a sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. Now listen, I may, I may lay an egg this morning when I preach. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's just, it's, you'll go home and say, I just didn't get anything out of that. You might say that, uh, well, the worship team didn't, didn't sing all the songs that, that, that I wanted them to sing. But the Bible tells us we have a responsibility here today. We're here to worship the Lord. And I'm here to preach the Word of God, not lay an egg. But I'm here to preach the Word of God. But what I'm saying is we have a responsibility as we come into the house of the Lord to bring a sacrifice of praise to the, to the Lord. So I encourage you today to be, the, to be the one who says, you know what? I'm going to worship God no matter what. My praise, my glory is going to be to God today. And so I'm asking you to bring a sacrifice of praise to the house of the Lord. Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here today. And Lord, we, we pray that uh, as, we, as we worship you today, that we will bring honor to your name today. Lord, meet us here today as we worship you. Lord, have your way in our lives. Change us today like never before. May we be like David who said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. And so, Father, Father, thank you so much for being here with us. And we bring our sacrifice of praise to you in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Worship. Come on, let's worship him. Open the eyes 
our prayer today Lord we come before you today God and say God open the eyes of our hearts what do you have for us today God that is our question and Lord whatever you do have that God you would produce that in our spirits Lord that it would become life to us and we would be changed from this day forward Lord Lord for those even at home watching on Facebook God that you would change us God we reach out to you and say, Lord, we come humbly before you and ask our God. And I confess, bowing here, I find my rest without you.
sing it again. Lord, I come. Nothing compares to this. 
What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. above every other name. Lord, it's majestic, it's powerful. And Lord, for that we shout unto you. Lord, in times we're in a valley or times we're at that mountaintop, it doesn't matter. We can shout to you and begin to worship you, God. Lord, you make mountains move. You have oceans that are in control, God. We worship your name today. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty
my Jesus, my Savior. Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty nothing compares your hand oh God is in everything Jesus in all of our trials and temptations we go through God you are in control you are always there to hold us oh God walk us through it Jesus for that God we shout unto you and say thank you Lord thank you for your goodness to us thank you for your faithfulness to us oh God for your provisions for us and decisions we make, oh God, that we would be godly decisions, God, not of this world, Jesus. God, we thank you for being here today. We thank you for your presence, oh God, both here and at home or in the office, wherever people are watching, God. Your, your spirit is filled in the rooms, oh God. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's good to be in the house, amen. God is so good. Why don't you guys find a couple of people? And we want to welcome you. If you're next door, guys, go ahead and mingle over there. We've got a lot of people here today, so and we are obeying by the rules. We are obeying by the rules. But go ahead and just find a couple people. So glad you're 
with us today, those of you who can be with us, and those of you who are at home uh, watching on uh, Facebook, we welcome you once again. So glad you're here. I got just a few announcements real quick. Uh, thank you once again for your faithfulness and your giving. And uh, the bucket is back there someplace. Some of you I know mail it in. Some of you uh, uh, go on Easy Tithe and, and do it that way. So we thank you so much for your faithfulness. Also, uh, um, continuing on Wednesday nights, uh, we'll be in the uh, book of Galatians. Uh, it'll be chapter 4 this Wednesday. It's only a half hour Bible study, but we invite you to come and be with us on Facebook. Uh, also, this Thursday night, we're continuing our Zoom um, our Zoom prayer group with Roy and Donna Newton, and I heard that they just had a great time this last Thursday. There were a couple, there were a couple of people in the first uh, service who uh, took part in that. Anybody take part in that on Thursday? Uh, Thursday, yeah, okay, yeah, awesome. So uh, anyway, uh, if you want to be a part of that Zoom prayer group, uh, go ahead and call the office. Give Kathy your information, and we'll she'll let you know uh, how how to get hooked up with the Zoom prayer group. All right, very good. Hey, if you would take your Bibles and let's turn to John chapter 15. And uh, we're continuing. This is actually the last of the I Ams of Christ. And uh, we've, we've talked about, uh, you know, Christ saying, I am the good shepherd. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the everlasting life. Uh, there are, there are uh, uh, seven of them, and so we, we are continuing today with uh, the very last one where he says, I am the true vine. So chapter 15 in the book of John. Okay. Starting with verse 1. Jesus said, I am the true grapevine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit so they will produce more fruit. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. Remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Uh, such branches are gathered into a pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. Amen. So today we want to took a, take a look at the, uh, the last of the I Am statements of Christ. In this statement, Jesus once again boldly proclaims his unity with God the Father. He says, I am the true vine. Now why would Jesus make a statement like that? And just what significance does it have for us today? It would do us good to do a little background. Uh, in chapters 13 through 17 of John, we see that Jesus is primarily speaking with his, uh, and dealing with his disciples. Now, at this particular time, they are either up in a room, in the upper room, I should say, or, 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 or somewhere on the way to the Garden of Gethsemane. We're not exactly sure. But we do know that it was springtime, and that was the time that the grapevines are pruned, and uh, Palestine was well known for its grapevines. Israel, in the Old Testament, was portrayed as a vineyard. In Psalms 80, verse 8, it says, You brought us from Egypt like a grapevine. You drove away the pagan nations, and you transplanted us into your land. Isaiah 5, 7. The nation of Israel is the vineyard of the Lord of heaven's armies. So the, the, the nation of Israel was considered to be a grapevine 
Jesus had given a number of parables regarding vineyards and grapes. So even if the disciples didn't happen to see any grapevines at that particular time, or vineyards or grapes, uh, that particular night that Jesus was speaking, still they would have been very, very familiar uh, with the with the terminology that Jesus was using, and that's I just love the Lord when he when he gives us illustrations from some of the normal things of life. Jesus has talked to us about grapevines. He's talked to us about sheep. He's talked the things that were around them that they can relate to. Another important factor to keep in mind that this was the time when Jesus began telling his disciples. And, and a lot of his followers, that he was leaving them. And we talked about this a little last week. Uh, he predicts his death, uh, the, his betrayal of some of his, one of his closest friends, of followers. We talked about Peter's denial. And so the disciples, for them, there was a lot happening really quickly. And it was difficult for them to grasp everything that Jesus was saying when their closest friend the, the one who had been with them for a better part of three years is now telling them that he's leaving them or he's telling them that he's going to give up his life this was difficult for them to grab a hold of so he begins this discourse by saying I am the true vine so why does Jesus portray himself as the true vine of God to his disciples? Well, there's, there's a couple of reasons, and I want us to take a look at them. If you're taking notes, you can, you can, they're not in your notes, but you can write these down somewhere. He wanted to let his disciples know that even though he wouldn't be physically present with them, that he would send the Holy Spirit. He would send the Holy Spirit uh, to both live with them and live in them. Secondly, he was going to use this opportunity to instruct his disciples to remain in him and remain in fellowship with him, stay close to him, that he was the only source of life that they needed. And that was through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now they may bear, he wanted them to bear fruit, and uh, he wanted them to receive answers to their prayers. So you might be asking, why stay connected to the vine? Uh, Pat, if you have that picture, I'd like you to, to put that up. So we've found a picture of a grapevine and uh, great looking clusters of grapes right there. What are those grapes connected to? No, they're not connected to the vine. The branch. What are the branches connected to? The vine. Yeah, David says me and Marlene. Yeah. Uh, but, the, but the branches are connected to the vine. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. And if you remain in me, you will bear much fruit. So I wanted to give you somewhat of a, a, a visual there. Um. Some of you might say, well, you know, I've accepted Christ before. And so I guess I've got fire insurance, huh? But, and you might even be saying, isn't that enough just, just, just to have Jesus in my life? And let me say, no, it is not. It is not enough. When we accept Christ, we do receive forgiveness of our sins. He actually comes and he takes residence in our life and we also live in Christ see staying connected to Christ is the key to this entire experience that we're talking about today there's joy there's fullness there's fulfillment by staying connected to the vine without that connection we remain lost it's so important for you and I to stay connected to the vine. So the first reason we need to stay connected to the vine, if you're taking notes, this will be in your notes. He prunes us. Now some of you are saying, well that doesn't sound like a good reason to stay connected to the vine. 
But I'm going to tell you, without pruning, there's no growth. God wants us to grow. He wants us to grow. And without pruning, there is no growth. Let's not forget who the gardener is. The gardener is the Father. And he goes through the vineyard with his pruning knife. And he has a definite purpose for pruning our lives. The purpose is to produce the best fruit possible. That's what a gardener does anyway. He's interested in producing the best fruit possible. That's exactly the whole emphasis of what Jesus is saying here. That we have a heavenly Father who loves us so much, He will go ahead and take His pruning knife and He begins to cut. See, God expected Israel to, to bear rich, beautiful fruit, tasty grapes. But the only grapes that He got from Israel were sour, were rotten, and many of them tasteless. And when he looks at our lives, your life and my life, he also has some expectations for us. He also has some expectations. That scripture, it teaches us, the scriptures teach, teach us that he expects us to have love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, long-suffering, those are the fruit of the Spirit. He expects that out of us. Those, those of us who claim to be born-again believers, He expects us to bear fruit. So when God picks up His pruning knife, He does so with a purpose in mind, that we would bear fruit. The fruit of the Spirit. For instance, if there's something in my life that is preventing me from producing love, He will work on me until I have fulfilled that purpose. We also need to remember that God not only holds the knife, but God holds a sharp knife. In order for the pruning to be effective, the knife must be sharp. A dull knife may cut the branch and it may cut the branch off but it will also damage the wood. See, God is not interested in us becoming damaged. Just pruned. He just wants to prune us, not damage us. And what does God use as a pruning knife? Well, I think he uses all kinds of things. How about circumstances? How many of, you, how many of your lives have ever been pruned by circumstances of life? Relationships. God will use relationships in our life to prune us. God even uses illness. To prune, to prune us. He uses trials sometimes to prune us. And yes, he even uses money problems to prune us. They all qualify as pruning knives. Another characteristic of a gardener is that they only remove what is unnecessary. All dead wood must be removed. All dead wood must be removed. Dead wood has a, the ability to harbor insects and rot, disease. And those are the kinds of things that can make their way into the vine and destroy any fruit that would, that would come from that. Live wood is actually cut back. Sometimes it's drastic. It forces the vine to start producing fruit rather than just wood. 
So in the same way, our Heavenly Father, He moves among us, cutting dead wood from our lives. He can't nor will He ever desire disease or rot to settle within us. His goal is to cut and cut and then cut some more until he sees fruit in us. If it's left to us, our flesh will always produce rotten fruit. So here he comes. He moves among us with a pruning knife, removing dead things such as bitterness, resentment, selfishness, anger, self-centeredness. He removes arrogance from us. He removes pride from us. Dead wood. Now for some of us, we have learned to live with the dead wood. And we just sort of feel like it's normal. But you've lived with the dead wood for so long you don't know any better. And you need to allow God to come in with his pruning knife and say, I want to make you more than what you are right now. I mean, let's just say, for instance, you've been maintaining a particular uh, habit or maybe you have an attitude towards someone else in your life and it's been going on for some time. And then suddenly you come across a verse of Scripture that convicts your heart about that wrong attitude, that, wrong, that, that, that place of bitterness in your life. And it just sort of flies in the face of what you've always believed. But the Spirit of God and God's Word is so much stronger that it begins to convict you. That thing you felt so justified, that bitterness that you felt so, so justified in having, that pride you felt justified keeping in your life. So here comes the Father with his pruning knife. He uses the word sometimes, and he corrects us, and we get pruned. It's sharp. The pruning knife is painful. It's supposed to be. Because, you know, coming face to face... With our, with our difficulties, with our faults, with our failures, with our things like bitterness that can hurt. What's really happening is God is working to cut out anything that doesn't look like Jesus. Are you looking more like Jesus today than you ever have in the past? Or are you allowing some of those other things to enter in? What we need to allow to happen is we need to allow God to come in with a pruning knife and prune us. Secondly, another reason we need to stay connected is number two, we, we can produce much fruit. That's God's desire that we produce much fruit. See, the Christian life really is a spiritual life. None of us has what it takes to make it on our own, to live it out. Jesus couldn't have put it any more clearly when he said, Without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. What he meant was that he alone is the source for our fruitful lives. He alone is our source. He wants to give us abundant spiritual life, and He is the source for that. Just as a branch will wither and die without the, the, the life-sustaining of, of the vine, so will our own attempts fail if we try to do this on our own. Our own attempts will fail if we Refuse to be connected to Jesus, the vine. 
And until we believe this, we will never we will never experience the Christian life the way God intended it. See, the best we'll ever do is produce fake fruit. How many of you have it at home on your tables? I mean, it looks good. But it'll never satisfy your hunger. See, real fruit must grow out of life. Christ is the vine, and all spiritual life flows from him. Just as a branch can only receive life from the vine, so we can only receive spiritual life from Christ. See, this all happens when we learn to abide or live in Christ. Christians who learn to abide in Christ, they produce much fruit. Trying doesn't produce fruit. Trusting in God does. Well, pastor, I've tried. I've tried. I keep trying, but nothing happens. You know, when I lived in Orange County, we had an apple tree in our backyard. And that apple tree just, just put out tons of apples every year. I've walked, I've walked back there before, and I watched them on, hanging there on the tree. I never saw one apple say, oh, I'm trying. Oh, I'm straining here. I'm trying. I'm trying. Doesn't have to do that. Why? You're connected to the vine, and those apples were good. They didn't have to strain. They just need the, needed the trust in the vine. We, we need never to forget Fruit does not just suddenly appear at once. It starts with a, bl a bud, a flower. Then comes the tiny little fruit. And we look at it and we say, oh, how cute. Hang on, it's got more growing to do. It's got more maturity to take place. And it doesn't happen overnight. It happens slowly. For this process to be completed in the believer, we must daily put our dependence on Christ. We need to yield to the Holy Spirit of God. It, it, it's, it's a moment by moment abiding in Him. I'm going to tell you right now, an hour on Sunday morning will not cut it for you. It won't happen. Well, you know, I went to church, did my thing. I sang, I worshiped. But the rest of the week, am I abiding in Christ? No. I mean, you can come here and still not abide in Christ. That's true. But when we abide in Him, we will start producing much fruit. Number three, we can ask for anything. That's what Jesus said. We can ask for anything. John 15, 7. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask for anything you want and it will be granted. Wow. Check it out. Getting whatever we want. I mean, when we pray, we just get what we want, right? What a great promise. But did you notice that there was a condition? The condition was that you abide. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you could ask whatever it is you want. There's a condition there. If we remain in him and his words remain in us, listen, we're not going to find ourselves asking for things that are contrary to God's will. There are those times in life when it seems like for all of us, it seems like we can't get our prayers answered. We pray, we fast, we claim scriptures, but nothing seems to work. How many have ever been there? Anybody? 
a few of you. See, a lot of times I just believe it's simply because we're not connected as we should be. In all of our lives, there are battles to be won. There are life-changing victories that need to be gained in our life. God wants that for us. And I can almost hear some of you saying, you know, I've asked many things in prayer, but I've never received an answer. I've been there, and I've felt that. I mean, I've prayed for people to get well, and they don't. I've prayed for marriages to be saved, and they don't. I've prayed for successful church programs to work in my church, and they don't always. I've prayed for people to live, and they die. Yet I believe with all my heart that God still answers prayer. But I've also learned from scriptures that there are conditioned conditions to answered prayer. There are conditions. First of all, we must have a right relationship with God. You know that God wants us to listen to Him first before He ever listens to us? It's true. If we're not paying attention to God's word, why should he pay attention to us? I mean, we spend days, weeks, and even months ignoring the word of God. But when we want something, we expect him to be Johnny on the spot. But that's not how it works. But when our relationship is right with Him, and we are in His Word, and we are remaining, we are connected, that's when we begin to understand God's will. That's when we say, this is the confidence that I have in Him, knowing that if we ask anything according to His will, that He hears us. We also must have a right relationship with other people. I mean, if you're at odds with others, especially people in the family of God, you will find it hard-pressed to see your prayers answered. In order for us to receive answers to our prayers, we must stay connected. And lastly... Number four, we bring glory to the Father. In verse 8 it says, When you produce much fruit, you are my disciples. This brings glory to the Father. This is our purpose for living. We, the creature, are to glorify the, crea the Creator. We, the creatures are the ones to glorify the Creator. And when we abide in Christ, we can do that. Jesus was such a great example of this. When He was baptized, a voice from heaven came and said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. When Jesus was transfigured, and he was shining brightly on the Mount of Transfiguration. A voice from heaven called out and said, This is my beloved Son. See, when we abide in Christ, God looks at us, and you know what he sees? He sees his Son, and he's pleased, and we bring God glory. Worship team, if you'll come back to the platform. When we're producing much fruit, we bring glory to God. So here's the question I want to conclude with today. 
What will you live for? What will you live for? Will you live for a good job? Would you live for a person? A wife, a husband? What will you live for? Will you live to bring glory to God? Will you live to stay in contact with the vine so that you can produce much fruit that will bring others to Jesus? What will you live for? Living the rest of your life to bring glory to God is going to require some changes. Priorities are going to need to change. Some of our schedules are going to need to change. Some of our relationships may need to change if we truly want to bring glory to God. You know what it'll actually do? It'll actually cause us to sometimes choose the hard path rather than the easy path. Even Jesus knew this. When he went to the Garden of Gethsemane, and I mentioned this last week, he said, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful. You can almost hear him say, and he didn't, I, I, I don't know that he said this, but he said, should I pray? Father, save me from this hour? But this was the very reason he came. He came to bring glory to the, his Father's name. Sometimes we have to choose the hard stuff. We'd like it easier, but boy, those pruning shears hurt sometimes. Jesus stood at a fork in the road. Should he stay connected with the Father? Should he fulfill the purpose of why God brought him here? in the first place or should he take the easy way out and he could have done that that's just what that's, that's what I love about Jesus I remember being in Israel last last September and I sat in the garden I'd like to say I sat in the same place he did but it was a garden And I recognize he made an incredible decision to obey his Father and go all the way to the cross. All the way. It was a hard decision. It meant he had to give up his own life. But he did it. He not only did it for us, but he did it so he, br he would bring glory to his heavenly Father. He didn't shrink back and say, I'd rather live a comfortable life here. He wasn't self-centered. He brought glory to his Father. And you know what? We face the same choice today, all of us. Will we stay connected to the vine? Our life source... Are we satisfied with just spending an hour here on Sundays or at home, an hour with your church family? Or will you choose to stay connected to the vine every day? Allow him to cut back the dead wood, the things that bring disease and rot, those things that those things that we deal with all the time like anger and bitterness and those types of things, pride. God, will you just cut those things out of us because I want to bear much fruit. I want to bear much fruit for you and I want to bring you glory, oh God. The choice is ours today. And I pray that we would choose to live the rest of our lives bringing glory to God. And the only way we can do that is staying connected to the vine. 
Now you notice I didn't say stay connected to church. Stay connected to Jesus. You can do that without coming to church. Now I want you to come to church because I, this is the place where we, or even at home, stay connected with, with what's going on with the church. But more importantly and most importantly, I pray that we would stay connected to Jesus. He is our source. Would you stand with me? Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. We sang it earlier. I want us to sing it again. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. pray today if there's someone that is here next door or listening at home and they have never had a relationship with Jesus Christ we talked about it today Lord how we just we we just need to confess our sins to you repent of our sins and say God we need you and I pray Lord Jesus if someone has never done that I pray that today will be their day that they begin to experience new life in Christ Jesus. Let today be their day, O oh God. But Lord, for the rest of us today, I pray that we would have that desire to stay close to you. And Lord, we know when the pruning shears come in and they begin to cut, that knife begins to cut into us, Lord, it's for our good. It's so that we would grow and produce much fruit, oh God. Lord, work on us. Change us, we pray. You are our source of life, and it's so important. God, it is critical that we stay connected to you. Thank you, Jesus. One more time, let's sing it. Lord, I need you. Lord, I need you. Oh, I need you. Every hour, I need you. My one defense, you're my righteousness. challenge
challenge you today, when you leave this place, decide and choose, I am going to stay connected to the vine. Amen? I want you, and the Lord does, but we want you producing much fruit. That's what, he, that's, that's what the Creator designed us to do, produce much fruit. Amen? God bless you. Have a great week. Amen. Thank you.